We're here with Ronnie Batista. Thanks for joining me today. Pleasure to be here. Um, and we're going to interview one another about getting buy-in for user experience research. Mm -hmm. So why don't you start with the first question? Um, I, I've, I've read, not the whole book, but I've read certainly a lot of your book, and, and I find it to be just a really, it's a great read, and it certainly captures a lot of what I'm seeing and hearing. What would you think, what would you say would be the biggest surprise that you had coming out, maybe of your initial hypothesis going in that was that was challenged as you talked to more and more people? Um, <laughs> I hoped that this was not just my problem, mm -hmm. and I think my biggest surprise is that I wasn't aware how much of a problem it is. Um, I started asking people about it as I wrote the book, and I noticed that um, most people say that this is their number one challenge at work try and get their stakeholders to even do research to begin with, or if they do research, to have them act upon results. This is not happening for many, many people. So it's actually, it's not, it's, it's more the magnitude of the problem itself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I hope this was okay. a big problem for many people, yeah. but I wasn't, I wasn't sure how, how much of a problem it is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. All right. Sure. Um, so let me ask you, why do you think it's so hard for people to sponsor UX research? Um, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think first and foremost is it's still a very, while I think we as practitioners can point to the ROI and, and speak very directly as to how it impacts business, how it impacts product services, websites, I think it's still very nuanced. I think the idea and the concept um, especially as it's been traditionally seen as sort of a tail end of the SDLC in terms of user acceptance testing, I think there's still a little bit of confusion as to where UX plays a role, and I think it still has, in, in the eyes of some leaders, a, a validation point uh, versus a really a, a more of an early front end, you know, point where you can actually start getting some of those ideas out on the table. It's still seen as sort of the, the, the bottom of the funnel type. Let's just make sure it works and people can use it. So, um, one of the things in your book which I really, like I said, enjoyed is you described the different types of stakeholders. You've yep. got your, I like to call upper management better in the mm -hmm. C-suite, and, and you've got your engineers, you've got your UX. What would you say, um, you know, in terms of, you've, heard, you've just said about the magnitude, where do you think the biggest problem exists today? So, uh, you may find this as a surprise. Many people struggle with engineers. Um, so first of all, I find that engineers are the easiest people to work with, and um, for one reason, actually, they really want to do a good job. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know an engineer that wants to do a bad job. They want their, the user experience of their creations to be good. That's what they want. Sure. And they don't care about you know the business and that. They want to, to produce something that is great, and I find that it's very easy to work with them because we have the same goals. Yes, they think differently than us, but they ha we have the same goals. Um, I think it's up to, I would call them decision makers. It could be a, a, a C-level person, it could be a manager, uh, middle management or something like that. It could be a product manager or even an engineering manager. Mm -hmm. um, people who make decisions based on research or people who make decisions whether to even go about research. Mm -hmm. That's where we have a challenge because they tend not to experience research um, because they're not, you know, they're not contributing. They're not creating the product. Right. Yes, they have. They make a lot of decisions about it, um, and they manage the staff, but they're not really creating it. So it's hard for them to be very close to the process of research. Uh, so these are the people I think we have most challenges with. And do you see them? Do you see engineering still as being quite siloed in that? You know, you're hearing a lot more about the blended teams, the agile environment, where you know you've got your designer near your near your developer. You're seeing. Is, 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 I mean, obviously, the more siloed they are, the harder it is. So you you still see and you're hearing about a lot of that still being the case. My experience in in the companies I worked for, let's say in the past eight years, except for one year of a, a break that I went to school, um, 
and I didn't see any silos. I was always a part of the team, mm -hmm. and I always uh, was surrounded by engineers. <laughs> we sat together, we, we were one team. Right. Uh, even if, you know, I report to someone and they report to someone else, we sit together, we, we work together, we meet. You know, it's, it's a day-to-day -day relationship, mm -hmm. so okay. I, I didn't see any silos. I'm sure there are in other companies. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm hearing about them, but I did not experience any. Okay. All right. So UX researchers um, try to balance tension, attention they, they, they have with doing research they are asked to do and doing research that they think they should do. And I know this is happening for both internal, for both, you know, with both internal and external clients. How do we, you know, do what we think is right, but still not make people angry with us? Wow. <laughs> now that's a question, and, and I think it's really, I think there's a degree of, um, of pragmatism and honesty that comes in this field that I think, you know, look, when you're, you need to make payroll and you need to, you know, get people off the bench and working, obviously you take sort of, you know, what's there, but I think that, um, we had one example I had from a previous company um, where we were uh, working with a large pharmaceutical company in support of subcontracted through an agency to test the design that they had. That they wanted to test some, some, some concepts around a website that they had slated to build in the, in the coming year. And our research, um, we came back and said, well, we talked to your targeted demographic, and we came back, and the answer is, you don't need a website. It's not where people are going to go. This this particular group, they're they're going to take advice from their doctor. If you want to kind of make an impression, what you really need to think about is how can we work with the the, the doctors and the, and the healthcare providers to kind of get this message out. Um, well, it turns out that then they came out with another RFP and they said, well, okay, so we want you to do a card sorting exercise to help us build this website. To which we replied, okay, well, that's great, but we kind of think you should probably do something else. Um, of course. Again, to, to make the payroll, right, we actually submitted, um, you know, and tried to, as best we could, sort of adjust our style to kind of what they were looking for. Suffice to say, we weren't selective. And I think they, I think there's a variety of reasons for that, but they certainly knew that we had that position. I think that it's a, um, it, it's, it, it really, it depends on the situation. It is, it's never an easy thing to do, but I think one of the things that's incumbent upon us is if not us, then who? If not the UX community saying, this is a bad idea. Let me try to show you why this is a bad idea. Let me show you the research. Let me, let me demonstrate to you, if, if not us, then who? And, and I think one of the things that, that, that I find exciting about some of the recent developments with Lean UX and whatnot is the attempt to very quickly show that you don't need, you know, um, long longitudinal studies and, and, and surveys of thousands of people to be able to go out and get a pretty decent idea if you can go out and talk to a tar you know a, a few targeted folks that, that you're trying to market to what you think what you're trying to build I think you can get those answers pretty quickly and I think that you know sometimes even that's not going to work but at least if you can demonstrate that you've actually gone out and you're not just doing it based on your opinion or the product manager's opinion or these two people you're actually doing it based on something that's evidence driven I think it's your best shot I find it. I find it very true. Uh, you know, demonstrating what it can do, what a small thing, what a small research activity can do, um, can go a long way. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you don't do what you think is right uh, in the beginning, I, I can do that in a, you know as as an in-house practitioner, sure. not with uh, with external clients, but. Um, you can do for for a period of time. You can do what they want. Sure. And then you gain credibility, and then you can start, you know, speaking up, and do these longitudinal yeah. studies. Yeah, they, it, they, it, they do have a place sometimes. If you come in, and I think that's something that also is, you know, because I think a lot of times we come in and we have this innate feeling we're yes. right, and this is the right way to do it. And I think sometimes if if we take our of our own a little bit. Uh, dose of our own medicine and actually know the audience that we're trying to reach, they need something a bit more tangible, exactly. So mm -hmm. if you can do something that's a bit more in service of what they want, and then maybe use that as the opportunity to introduce something new. Well, by the way, I, I tested this out for you, and you know what? I actually asked them this, and, and look what they thought about that. And sometimes you can start to yep. sort of pull them over, but you have to build that trust and credibility first. 
So a question for you. Yeah. This is the question I get asked all the time, and I think it's really interesting. So if you're in, a, if you're in the position to, and when I say sell, right, it's, it's whether it's internal, whether you're actually literally trying to sell as a client, um, who's the best, who should we talk to? Who's the first person, you know, let's, let's look at an org chart, and who do we need to sell research to? And I have an answer, okay. right? But is it IT? Is it business? Is it product? Like, who do we go? Who's the ones that are going to buy this stuff? So, again, my experience in the last eight years when I worked in, you know, very engineering-oriented organizations, um, I would go bottom-up. I would not start high up. Really? Yeah. I would go with the engineers, with the, you know, the people who are actually doing something about the, the design. Mm -hmm. Um, I would start with them. Okay. And if they're bought in, I feel that, um, so th that good stuff happens. And that's really interesting because I, I'm very much, I, and I'm, I did my dissertation on bottom-up and top-down theories <laughs> of implementation, so I'm very, um, I, I love the field, and I, and I, but I, there's always needs to be a balance of both, clearly, right? You're, you're saying start. I, I think that you need to get, oftentimes the only way to get to the top is you've got to, you know, you, it's very rare that you're going to get, you know, C-level audience for yeah. an idea, so you've got to kind of have to work your way up. I do find, though, that if there are certain parts of the quote-unquote bottom that if you, um, you're only going to get so far until you can start to make those connections outside. I think more is, is do you feel that, again, um, without the, without level-based, but more sort of um, business line-based, so product, IT, business marketing, is there a particular group that you would go after first? Product. Product. Product okay. for you know, why? Without hesitating. Um, same reasons. They are the ones who actually do something about creating what people are going to use. Uh, they're not marketing this thing. They're not talking about it with other people. They are the ones who actually create it. Mm -hmm. They want to do a great job. Right. And I think that if they're bought into this, they will do my job. They will talk to the higher ups. They will talk to marketing. They would, you know, do my job or the thing that we perceive as our job. Right. So, and I, I, I talk about it in the book. We shouldn't fight our wars. Other people should do that for us. Uh, other people who have good reasons to do it for us. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I truly believe that product is, is you know, the first, if not most important, audience we should be. It's interesting. I mean, I, I would, and I, I've worked with a lot of product uh, folks in the past, and, and definitely I would say of, you know, if it, it was to purely pick an industry, absolutely, it would be it would be product. One of the things, though, that I've, I guess, seen, and, and I did this, and again, in a previous company, we were talking about sort of how do we go to market, and I drew sort of a, you know, your typical sort of two-by-two two magic quadrant, and I said, okay, so let's let's talk about strategic, um, strategic and tactical, and then human centric, either human centric, you know, they are human centric or they're not human centric. To me, I, I actually, um, if you have purview into who's in that organization, the ones, and I think this is in your book as well, is those that actually get it, those that are at least open to the idea, they might not know exactly how you do it, but they see it and they feel it. Mm -hmm. To me, that's who you go for first. And, and in, in one previous, again, uh, previous company, our biggest client was the IT guy. Mm -hmm. Not the business, not product, like, but he got it. And that opened so many more doors for us. But I think that there is a, to me, in terms of being able to get buy-in for stakeholder, it's finding the most senior member that has a, again, for lack of a better term, a human-centric mindset mm -hmm. that actually gets what this is and, and um, beyond the... Um, Beyond the, it's a good to check off that we have a director of UX, where they actually literally get it and see the value in doing that. And in talking to them and talking to executives and talking to, to, to leaders and upper management, you can hear very quickly the way that they, they respond to you, be they an analytic or, you know, or a real sort of, you know, right brain, you know, expressive. You can hear very quickly whether they, at their core, get it. And I think that the chance of success is, is so much greater if you have somebody that has that in. And I think you even put it in the book, like, if they don't have that, sometimes it's really not the cost of, the cost of trying to win that sometimes isn't even worth the battle. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I preach for uh, not, not fighting with people who don't get it. Yeah. Just work more with people who get it, and, and yeah. the other ones will come back to you Absolutely. later on. Um, so let me ask you this. So I, 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 I have many, many case studies in the book contributed by many people. 
I have I'm interviewing a lot of people. I asked them for, I asked them for, for stories. All of them but one told me successful stories for getting by and for research. Only one brave person gave me a story that did not have a happy ending. Can you share a story about a, a client that you, you know it doesn't end well that the client is bought in and doing you know what you thought they should do? I can. Okay. You don't have to expose. <laughs> I, of you know, course, the... I will not. I will protect the innocent. <laughs> um, we had a client that I actually had from uh, that that I had brought up from previous um, uh, engagement, and so we had worked together at, an, at another company in another capacity. Um, we were brought in to um, assess the uh, the usability of a. Um, a tool that was for this professional industry to search legal documentation for this mm -hmm. professional industry. Um, by the time we were brought in, um, there was already the, the 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 train had left the station. It was it was it was UAT. Um, when I first pitched this, the my my client, my contact said basically, okay, you know, I want you to put in the pitch that if this if we find that this is pretty bad, that we're going to postpone. The release of this until we can fix it. So of course, you know, I put it up very nice, and so I get the phone call, and he says, "So congratulations, you won the work. Just need you to do one thing. I need you to change that slide and say we're gonna. This is gonna be UAT, and that afterward, you know, we'll put some recommendations for a future release. Okay. So effectively, you got it, but we're going. We're going. So we did it. Very, very, um, you know." did interviews in, in printing closets and very strange places to get this done and get it in under the wire. And we came back out and we had about 14, about 14 to 16 recommendations, but we said, here are three that if you don't change, there is a train, here is the wall, you are going to hit this wall. So it was at 1130 and I was walking into a meeting, this is about two months after we, we had done the test, I'm walking into a meeting, I get a call from my client, he says, how you doing? He goes, you got a second? I said, yeah, sure. He goes, okay, well I got you on speaker. And I have X, Y, and Z in the room. And the things you said were going to happen, happened. And now we, what are we going to do? So we proceeded over the next course of, I guess, about 18 months to two years to do a successive series of, of basically tweaks to this. When from day one, it was, look, we need to take a step back. We need to really reassess what this is. You know, whether we develop something, you know, in parallel and keep this going, but we can only always get to the point of where they only wanted us to just do a little bit of validation on this piece and, and kind of keep moving on. At the end of our engagement, we were literally getting comments back from people that were saying, I'm exhausted. You are, these changes, stop making these changes. Now, these changes were, you know, incrementally better each time, but even the customers of this product were finding themselves like, it's enough already, like, change it or don't change it, but each time I log on, it seems like you're introducing, you know, so they, they, they wanted to, they were stuck in an SDLC that had them doing periodic incremental changes when they really needed to stop, take a step back and do something. That was when I had left the engagement. I'm, I'm happy to say that since then, this is a company that's actually invested in now, and they've, they've got a director of UX, he's in there, he's a great guy, and he's doing great work, but prior to that, it was really struggling with a company that, um, you know, again, well intended, but did not have um, did not have the uh, the fortitude to really take that step back and, and revisit. So we weren't as successful, I think, as we could have been, um, because we were taking. I think we were basically responding to um, right. to this company's struggle. Cool. Thanks. Sure. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think? Five years from now. Oof. Love those questions. You and I say whatever you no, want. No, because I, I have to say I am I am so <laughs> jealous just seeing the people that you've talked to and and the conversations you have. Really, it's it's like I I follow you and and all the kind of great conversations that you have. You clearly have I I would say arguably one of the best pictures now. Um, I don't think too many people in our industry have had the opportunity to talk to so many people. Um, and so many leaders in our field and really sort of figure out kind of what's there. Do you see something? different? Do you see anything that, um, if, if I was entering the industry today, that five years from now, you would say, well, you know what, if you're going to start looking, if you're going to start 
playing around? If you're going to go here, because this is where we're going. Um, again, I'm going to stall until I have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed one thing. Um, I, I didn't count it, but I think uh, maybe um, 25 of the 30-something interviews I held were with UX people, or people who define themselves as in the UX field, and the rest are not. I think the ones that I highly recommend watching, and I really think there are a lot of interesting lessons learned, are in the interviews that are with people who are not UX people, who observe our field from afar. And, um, and if I would recommend something for people is that, I don't know, if you go to a conference, you usually hear the UX people. If there are some people who are not UX people, don't avoid them. They're, they're there for a reason and you should probably listen to them and what they have to say. We have so much to learn from others. Um, that also relates to the topic of the book. We should develop empathy to other professions mm -hmm. and, and we can learn more about how we handle ourselves in front of our clients, internal or external. I think that's, a, I think that's absolutely one of the things that um, I think we've fallen victim to. Yep. Not that there aren't great voices in the field, but I think that it's become a little bit of an echo chamber. Mm. I think that you're hearing a lot of the same voices, the same ideas, the same concepts being, you know, repackaged and sort of resold, all good stuff, but I do think that, you know, if if we're really going to learn, we need to look at the companies that are being successful today, and whether these people are active in whatever communities are existing, they're being successful doing UX related work, and and they're doing it without needing to be, like I said, on a speaker circuit or, yeah. or and I think you're absolutely right. And, and so I would ask, you know, I'll ask you again, so who do you think, are there um, names in the, in, names, you know, I think you meant, obviously Eric Rice is one yeah. I know. That Eric Rice. Eric Rice, sorry. There's an Eric Rice. Right, also, no, I know Eric Rice. He's right. also good. But I love not. Eric. No, I, Eric and I, yeah. yeah I'm Eric talking about I, the Eric Rice of, uh, <laughs> Eric Rice of the Lean Startup yeah. Movement. I would, um, you know, read what he what he writes his book and his appearances. I would try to follow him, and also follow the movement that that, that followed the lean startup, mm -hmm. the lean UX movement. Mm -hmm. um, I think they opened the ears of audiences that we were not aware of their existence. Who who would ever thought that startup companies would think of hiring a UX person after the first founders? That's happening today. Right. But you see. You see. You know. UX-led startups. You see a founder who's looking for a UX founder, they call it. These are the names that they use today. Wow. I think it's all because of that, and, and I, would, I would definitely follow that and see what's happening, what's happening there. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Go for it. So, <laughs> I know you were uh, intrigued by one of the videos uh, that I published. I think it was the first or second one. Um, the one created by Amber Light. Uh, partners from the UK about UX illustration and how they use them in research. Tell me what intrigued you. Um, I, I am, you know, always um, amazed at when there is a, a concept in front of you the entire time and you just, you know, you just don't see it. And I think that in the last year, um, the, the concept of visualization, uh, of actually getting past what traditionally has been mountains of paperwork, um, you know, long-winded, you know, business requirements, functional requirements, technical requirements, you know, written in these huge tomes that need to be reviewed by, by various, it doesn't, it never has really, really worked, um, but nobody seemed to have a better solution. And, you know, flipping the equation and saying, okay, how about this, right, before we go and commit, all of this paperwork and writing, which effectively we know will change as the design process and as development goes through, let's try to get something on paper. Let's try to, or, or, or on a board or on a screen that says this is what we're actually thinking about. Because again, I, I, am, I always like to say, you, you know, if you think about, well, we can think about anything. If you close your mind and say, I'm having ice cream on a porch, right? What, what kind of ice cream is it? Is it vanilla? Is it chocolate? What kind of porch is it? Am I at the beach? Am I in somebody's backyard? Those visualizations, it's very easy to put on paper what you think it is, but to get people together in a room and to really think about this quickly, right? Very quickly, very, you know, facilitated. Capture business requirements while you're capturing visualizations. And then when people say, okay, yeah, well, we want a left column. No, 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 not that big. We want it that. 
okay, yeah, and if you can get everybody in the room to align on that left column, you've probably saved countless meetings, flame emails, late night conversations, because everybody actually got together and said, okay, that's what we mean when we say left column. And I think visualization, lots of organizations are really, you know, there's even or, that specialize in it, but I think the BizThink movement, you know, with, with, with MJ Broadbent um, and Dee Myers, I mean, they're, they're, they're really pushing the envelope of saying, Let's, let's think about how we can bring this into an SDLC, compress the requirements phase to weeks versus months, right, and really get to a point where the rework required um, is, is so much reduced. And I, I think that, you know, like I said, in terms of being on Dunos, when you see it and you hear it, you're like, yeah, of course, but we haven't really been selling it. And I think now it's starting to pick up. I think with, with the lean startup movement and the idea of this of sort of iterative prototyping, I think that's really starting to pick up. And it's, I think it's exciting, and I think it's a great field um, for UX people to play in. The only thing that I would want to make sure, because that room is going to have stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to have business. It's going to have... You know, all of the people that will be in, involved in a JAD session, I just want to make sure that the user, be it an employee, a customer, a partner, a vendor, that they are somewhere informing this as well. That it's not just either before or after that there is some degree of saying, okay, in this wheel of business, you've got business, you've got IT, let's make sure our audience plays some part in that requirements definition as well. That's all I have for you. Do you have any last question for me? No. <laughs> okay. No, that was great, though. Thank you very yeah, much. it was. Thank you. <laughs> Now, do we do this? <laughs>